What is up? Make some noise, Substance. We are so blessed you made it to church today. And again, if you're a visitor, I'm Pastor Peter. And, and really, our, our service is going to be a little different today. We, we kind of rearrange the order of our service a little bit more. We put the, uh, the song portion of our worship service at the end. And I'm going to be preaching more right out of the gate because today is Baptism Sunday. One of my favorite Sundays of the year. And of course, we don't always do church uh, quite like we're going to do it today, but we're still going to have some fun. And if you're new here, you're going to notice that we're not exactly a typical church. And you could, you could say, yeah, I, I figured that out by the name of your church. Substance? Who names a church Substance? Uh, well, we, we thought when we actually launched Substance uh, 14 years ago, we thought, let's give it a name that sounds a little more like a nightclub than a church. And part of that was because that's where I gave my life to Christ in the nightclub. And so we like to have fun. I kind of grew up just bored in church today. And so really the whole idea, if I could summarize the whole idea even behind our church, substance is actually an alternative name for Christ in the scriptures. He's the substance of things hoped for. He's the the substance of realities yet to come. And so our whole idea was if we could just kind of strip back all of the legalism that churches get into, all of the weirdness that churches fall into, all of the unnecessary traditions that sometimes actually make it harder for people to experience God, if we could just boil Christianity down to the gritty, life-giving, joy-filled basics, what would it look like? And, and, and hopefully you'll experience a little bit of that today. Uh, but uh, right out of the gate, I, I do have a, a shorter message, and I want to jump right in by telling a story that sets the table for where we're about to go on Baptism Sunday. Uh, but first, has anybody ever lost your TV remote before? Just raise your hand if you have. Just, it's okay. You know, it's funny how over the years this little device was created to save time so that we don't have to get up off our couches to, in order to turn something on the television. And yet, ironically, I've spent more time looking for remotes than I have saved time by having a remote. Can anybody relate to that? I, I just, a while back, I, I lost my remote, and I could not find it for weeks, and it drove me nuts. And of course, like, like a lot of people, I looked everywhere. You know, you remove all the couch cushions, and, and, and under the couch, underneath the recliner, everywhere, and I couldn't find it. And of course, you just... Uh, you know, at the time, I had three little kids, and so, um, and you know, little kids, they kind of wander off with it every once in a while. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I found, I found the TV remote in, in toy bins and p- random places, and so I, I looked everywhere. I started looking in every one of my kids' bedroom for this remote. I was bound and determined to find that remote, and when you're looking in weird places, you know, you kind of get weary after a while, and so I had to do the unthinkable. I had to reach my my hand back into the bowels of the couch just to see if the remote went really deep in there. And nobody, how many of you know you never want to deep reach, you never want to do the deep dive into the back of that couch because you never know what you might find. It's gross back there, especially when you have kids. And of course, I reached my hand back in there and all of a sudden I felt all sorts of textures and strange things and uh, you know, I found those, those like, like gummy dots candy, you know what I'm saying? That, that kind of, and I, in the midst, mixed in with goldfish crackers, mixed in with Cheerios, mixed in with old raisins, mixed in with mystery stuff, mixed in with old nickels. It's kind of like a new trail mix, except it's called couch mix. You know what I'm saying? And if, you're, if you get the handful with the dirty old quarter, you win. You know what I'm saying? If you eat it. I, I just, no, it's seriously, it was so gross. And, and our couch had so much in it. I was actually shocked that that much stuff could be in the back of our couch. I was pulling out missing toys. I even pulled out a diaper, a can of soup. I kept thinking, what are people doing in this couch? You know, the, the, the diaper was clean, which made it even a greater mystery. But still, no remote of all the things that I found. I, I even found another remote from the previous TV set that I had already gotten rid of. But not the one that I was currently looking for. And so I, I finally thought, you know what, maybe I can go online and find a replacement remote. So I, I'm on the internet. And get this, the only replacement remote was $85. 
It's ridiculous. And none of the universal remotes worked with this particular TV and entertainment set that I had. And, 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 and like, it was a disaster. I mean, come on, church. This is America. We shouldn't have to get up off our couches. At least that's what I said. And I was mad. I was mad. And I couldn't deal with it. And so, you know, I'd lose motivation and I'd despair. And then a couple days later, I'd be like, you know what? Maybe I have enough energy to go look for it again. And so I'd start looking for it. And I would, it, became, it became an obsession for me. Can I just call it that? It became an obsession. I am going to find this remote before I die, no matter what it takes, no matter how much money I have to spend. I even checked my car which you know it's getting weird when you're looking for your TV remote in the car. I literally, I, and I, some of you will say that I crossed the line into insanity by the next thing that I did, but I, um, I literally started seam ripping the back of the fabric off of my couch, okay? Because I, I thought, and some of you are like, you did not. I, okay, listen, I'm like, I will find this remote. It's in there somewhere. I know it. I know it's in there. And, that, and when I started doing that, my wife finally said, enough. You, like she, she was like, you've gone over the line. Well, okay, and I, and I realized, okay, fine. I can, I can get up off the couch and I can do this manually. Well, two months later, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't live with myself. And so I literally flipped over all the furniture in our living room. Like I had just, like we were moving in all over again. It was all upside down. And when my wife walked in on me, she found me on the floor and I was kicking my couch, hoping to dislodge this missing remote. And she just thought, oh no, this is it. My husband has officially lost his mind again. And so right there on the spot, she started an intervention on me. And she's like, Peter, please, just, just let me buy the new system. It doesn't matter. And I'm like, no, no, it's the principle of the matter. I will not be defeated. And you are either for me or you are against me. <laughs> and I remember like when the words finally came out of my mouth and I started realizing how, how, how ridiculous I was sounding, I just kind of, I literally laid down on the carpet of our family room because there were no chairs to sit in. They were all flipped upside down. And I laid down on the carpet, and I, I listened to myself, and, and then my wife said this, this phrase that really, you know, my wife says to me a lot, and she says, Peter, did you pray about it? And you know, when somebody gets spiritual and you're not in the mood, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> It was like, woman, do not get spiritual on me. I know that's kind of disconcerting to hear from a pastor, but I, I just, you know what I mean? Like, I, here, here's what I found over the years. When, when we are not getting healthy, we become critics of those who are. Did you know that? That actually, I believe that when people, when you make a decision to get healthy in your life and the people around you who are, who are wanting to get healthy, they'll celebrate you and what you're doing. But if people are not getting healthy, they become critics of those who are. Why? Because your decision to walk towards freedom makes them feel even less free. And it's just, there's a principle there. And in the midst of that moment, I was not interested in praying to find the remote. And yet I knew my wife was right, like she normally is. And so I finally was like, okay, so I literally I'm on the floor and I'm like, God, clearly I am out of control, pardon the pun. I cannot find my remote to save my life, and Lord, I believe that you know where it is, and I believe that you can help me or work it out for my benefit in some supernatural way, and so I pray that you would help me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I, I remember I finished the prayer, and just I kind of gave the couch one last little frustration kick, and it was like, boom, you know, it was like I just wanted that one little last moment. And I kicked the couch. All of a sudden, thud. I heard something, and I sat up, and I'm like, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And I reached my hand into the back of the couch, and guess what I found? My missing remote. I won. I won. <sighs> that felt good, didn't it? Okay, so the reason why I shared that story today is because I think it serves as a great metaphor for what happens to a lot of us 
when we feel out of control, literally out of control. And I know that that story is kind of a superficial story because most of you are thinking, Peter, that's just a stupid little techno, like a piece, it's a remote control. It doesn't really matter. And yet, uh, the truth is though, I think all of us can get that way when we feel out of control. And maybe for you today, it's, it's not as superficial. Maybe it's something more serious. There's been moments in my life where I've lost my health or I've lost a relationship and, and maybe today you have the same thing. You've lost your health or you've lost your job or you've lost something in your life. I think that when we feel out of control or when, we've lo when we lose things, there's this emotion that's really hard to deal with. There's this feeling of abandonment that, and victimization that it's easy to, to sink into. And, and sometimes when we're in pain, spiritual solutions feel like the last thing Thing we're interested in, and yet, spiritual solutions are oftentimes the thing we need most in our life. I, I, I think it suffices to say that when none of us like the feeling of being out of control, and, and obviously there's a lot of research in psychology, those of you who really, uh, if you dive into this, there's a lot of research proving that happiness and a sense of control, a feeling of control are oftentimes interrelated. And of course, all of this research is what gave birth to the self-help movement over the last several decades. And so the self-help movement was, if we can create the sense of control, a feeling of control in people that do not have it, then somehow they're gonna have more happiness in their lives. And so that's why there's a million books, self-help books on a million topics from parenting to health, food, to all sorts of stuff, trying to give people this, this idea of control. But what's interesting is, is over the last three decades, four decades of the self-help movement, there's a lot of new research actually showing that the self-help movement is one of the most self-destructive movements that's ever afflicted the United States. And if you're out there and you're like, well, why? How could self-help movement actually be destructive? Well, because, um, let's be honest, control is actually an illusion. You cannot actually get control over your life. And what do I mean by that? People who, still, people who exercise still get heart attacks. People who wear bike helmets still can get hurt. People who have security systems still get robbed. You see, at some point or another, it's gonna happen to you or someone you love. Life will break through the illusion of control. And when people have that encounter, or when people know someone who has that encounter, not only do we get depressed, we get into total and complete despair. Because suddenly we feel like, it's kind of like the Instagram generation. It always feels like life is working better for someone else other than us. We always feel like we're the exception to the rule and there are a greater number of people who feel like the exception to the rule more than ever before in the history of our country. It's because there's so many people out there with a half truth and a testimonial saying, you can have the feeling of control. Not realizing, well, at some point, control eludes us. No matter how hard we work, control eludes us. For example, okay, um, you know, we're constantly being told through advertisements, if we just work hard enough, we can achieve this illusion. If you just get enough strategy, if you save enough money, if you just do act enough safely, eat enough health food, right? Uh, for example, humans falsely think they can control far more than they do. There was a study done uh, where people could actually, with the study, the test subjects, you could win $1,000 if you rolled a, a number 12 with, with a pair of dice. Okay, so, and what they did is they took two groups of people and with this, with this award of, of 1,000 bucks to roll this number 12, and what they did was is they allowed one group of people to roll the dice by themselves, and then they allowed another person, they had to watch while somebody else rolled the dice for them. And right before this happened, they would ask them, how confident are you uh, that you're going to get this? And, and interestingly, they found that um, humans were across the board, all felt like the outcome would be more positive if they could hold the dice themselves. There was something about the feeling of control, of throwing these dice that somehow made them way more positive about the outcome, whereas people who did not have the ability to roll the dice, by and large, had a much more negative concept of the outcome, even though mathematically it doesn't matter. 
Mathematically, I think we all know that the odds are the same whether we roll the dice or whether somebody else rolls the dice. But you know what I'm saying? That, that there was this illusion of control that overtook people. And, and out of that, interestingly, out of this research, um, so the, the people generally believe their luck increases when they feel a sense of control, which is why, like in lottery tickets, what they started doing was they started making lottery games where you can scratch off certain things. But the reason why they did that is because they figured if they can give people this feeling that they are controlling, like I had the choice of choosing this thing versus that thing, that they would all of a sudden be more likely to purchase more tickets. And so um, lottery ticket sales skyrocketed when they gave people this illusion of control. Now the reason why I'm sharing all this is because there are entire industries that will exploit this idea of control, this illusion of control. I mean, you could go into the insurance agencies are all just saying, hey, listen, you can control your future if you just buy enough insurance for everything. If you could just get insurance for every possible thing that could happen to you. Um, and then security systems, uh, life protection systems, be it, be it uh, helmets or, you know, again, car alarms. They're always trying to exploit this idea that somehow if you spend enough money, you're all of a sudden going to be immune to anything that could happen to you. The exercise industry, if you work out, if you do this sit-up, if you eat this, you know, special shake, all of a sudden your whole life expectancy will change. And so we pay all sorts of money for things that will make us feel more secure, experience more strategy, or, or feel really more in control. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that all these things are bad, but inevitably at some point you're going to realize that there, despite all the things you can can, can that you can control in your life, there are far more things you cannot control. People who exercise still get heart attacks. People with home security systems still get robbed. And no matter how fancy my remote gets, it will still find a way to get lodged in that couch. What's the deal? <sighs> That's why the Bible teaches this. The only way to get true control is to lose control to the one who controls it all. It sounds like a paradox. I, I'm saying it sounds like a paradox, but the only way to truly get in control is to lose control to the one who controls it all. And, and that, the reason why I'm sharing that is because that, my friends, is what baptism is really all about. It's where we bury our agenda under the water. Baptism is actually a gravesite committal. That's why they say in, in Romans 5, it talks about burial through baptism. When you lay somebody down in the water, it's a gravesite committal. You're saying, listen, you have now died. Your agenda, your, your ability to live your life the way you think see fit is no longer applicable, you're dead, and your life is now in Christ, okay? And then, but, but the cool part about baptism is we don't leave people dead. We actually, they come back out of the water, which is symbolic of Christ raising back to life on the inside of us. In other words, Christ in you is your hope of glory, and that's why the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, the real, the real mystery of baptism is essentially this, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. You rose back up, and Christ now lives in you and through you. It's not you loving your spouse and your coworkers. It's Christ in you. It's not you being patient with the person who cuts you off or the red light that just never seems to change. It's Christ in you with an unlimited amount of patience, an unlimited amount of love, enabling you to live a life that you could have never lived on your own. That's what baptism is. And, and, and so, and yet, like, again, I, I want you just to see that, that form of control, biblical control, through losing it, versus the world's version, okay? So there, there's so many things marketed at us that give us this illusion of control. For example, there's a huge number of programs designed to help our kids succeed better in school, right? And many of them are, are like brain training and others are just old-fashioned tutoring and my wife and I use this all the time with our kids. Yet get this, did you know that one of the greatest ways to increase your kids' grades or grade point average is simply church attendance? Did you know that? 
Research has shown that kids and teenagers who attend church on a weekly basis have significantly higher grades than the general population, significantly higher graduation rates than the general population, and significantly higher grade point averages. Kids and teens who attend church weekly uh, are significantly better at time management, self-management, have higher bachelor rate of bachelor's degrees than the general population, have a higher rate of master's degrees than the general population. In many ways, if you look at uh, like uh, academics from a scholarly standpoint, church attendance is one of the, the holy grails. And yet, does anybody talk about it? No, because you can't sell that. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't sell as, as good. The same paradox actually exists in the health industry. There are millions of exercise programs, exercise devices, healthy eating programs. People spend tens of millions on these programs with the hope of extending their life expectancy, and yet research shows, once again, one of the greatest ways to increase your life expectancy according to the actual life expectancy data is simply church attendance. People who attend church on a weekly basis live seven to 14 years long longer than the general population, the greatest of any demographic in the United States. What's going on there? I don't know. I suppose we could theorize. Uh, but in, in your, maybe you're here today and you're like, well, Pastor Peter, are you saying that I don't need to exercise or eat healthy as long as I come to church? Okay, no, I'm not saying that. Okay, you should eat healthy, you should exercise, you should graduate, okay? These types of things. I, I'm not discouraging these things. Go ahead, buy insurance, don't feel guilty about it. Buy health shakes, okay? So just go for that. But I, I really, what I'm trying to say is, is, is there's a supernatural component to life. And when we understand baptism, that we're basically saying, I don't have that in and of myself. I need something from the outside of me to come add the super to my natural, and therefore I am supernatural. And that's what baptism is. And, and how do we get it? We surrender control to the one who controls it all. And that's why Jesus said uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 6, the defining characteristic of a person with a heavenly father is peace. But a defining characteristic of pagans, people who do not have a relationship with God, is striving. They're always running after their needs. They're always worrying. They strive, they run. They strive, they run. They strive, they run. But as for you, Jesus says, as for us, those of us who believe believe in God, here is the secret, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that everybody else in the world is running after, they're just going to be supernaturally added to you. You don't even have to do it. All, you worry about it. You, all you have to do is meet God's needs and he'll take care of everything else in our lives. Surrender to the kingdom of God. And, and the reason why I'm sharing this is because when I think back on when I lost my TV remote, I kind of think that God was actually trying to teach me a poetic lesson. No matter how hard I looked, I think God knew, God knew exactly, oh my gosh, the way that remote control got lodged into your couch, there is no way you will ever find it unless you completely destroy your couch. You know what I'm saying? God knew that. You see, he knew that I was embarking on a, in, a, on a futile journey to find something I would never find on my own. And in a similar way, I think all of us will find ourselves in a circumstance that feels futile. Every week I talk to single people who are like, I'm never going to find the one. And, and, and I'm always like, honey, chill. You know what I'm saying? Like, God's got someone for you, but God knows you're not going to find them until you truly just surrender to his way and his, his, his timeline, which I know can be frustrating. The same thing can be true when we're asking God to heal us, when we're asking God, we're, you know, a lot of people, they're looking for that dream job, the dream salary, the dream house, the dream circumstance, and all the while, God's saying, listen, I know, I know what you need even before you ask Matthew 6, 8, I'm going to provide all that you need according to my glory glorious riches in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. All I need you to do is just chill. Surrender control to me. I control it all, and in my perfect timeline, I've got a perfect plan. Would you trust me? And I believe that God brought you to church today to say that to you. Would you trust me? Would you trust me? Because at the end of the day, come on, I could quote research to you for the, you know, until I'm blue in the face. And if you're wondering where I have all that research, just it's in my book, Broken Escalators. I have literally more than one major university study to prove every single thing that I just told you today. But listen, my point is this, is that the world spends billions of dollars trying to get all these things. And yet the mere act of putting God's kingdom first can do all of these things. What? It's crazy. 
And I'm not trying to imply today that if you just follow God, then everything will always go the way you want in the timeline that you want it. I'm not saying that at all because that's not true. But I do believe that when we follow Christ, when we, when we die to our agenda and let Christ live our lives through us, I believe that on the, if you take a broad view of your life, people will see that the favor of God on your life is undeniable. And that's what I want for you. And that's why, man, today is such a powerful day because when people get baptized, once again, they're saying, I don't have what it takes, but God in me and through me does. And, and, and maybe you're here today, and I, I, just, I, I just feel led to just say this. This is kind of a more spontaneous thing, but if you came here today. Some of you, you actually didn't come to get baptized today. You came to support someone who is getting baptized. And yet, I just have this sense that there's a couple of you who God is just kind of gently knocking on the door of your heart and saying, loved one, maybe today is your day to get baptized. And, and, and me even suggesting that makes some of you nervous because you know that's what's happening right now. And you're like, but I don't have clothing. I didn't bring a suit. I don't have a shirt. Listen, we got, we got it all. We got it all. We got towels. We got really cool t-shirts. We got shorts. We got changing stations. We got everything that you could need in order to get baptized. If that, it, listen, all I'm saying is, is just consider it. And, and baptism does not mean that you've completely resolved all of your doubts. It doesn't mean uh, uh, like you're ready to be perfect. It means that you know there's more and you know that Christ is the solution to help you get to that more. And if that's something you believe today, then I want to encourage you, just take that step. And here's the beautiful part. The moment we do that, and the moment we die to our agenda, our sense of control, that's when God adds his resurrection power to those areas where we need it most. And so where is that area today? Where could you use more of the resurrection power of God? If you've already been baptized and you just have an area of your life where you just want resurrection power, then just once again present it to God in this moment. I believe he sees that. He hears your prayers, and maybe you're here today, and, and you know it's time to press the reset button. This is what I want to do. If you're here today, and you've never given your life to Christ, and you want to press that reset button, just in this moment, just between me and God and you, this is what we're going to do with all eyes closed, all heads bowed. If, if you want to give your life to Christ or press the reset button, just throw your hand in the air. And just between you, me, and God, I'm going to look at you. I'm not going to call you uh, out. I'm not going to make you stand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I'm not going to force you to get baptized or anything like that. Just I'm saying this is a little baby step. If you're here today and you just want to say, hey, I want some supernatural in my life, um, then, then on the count of three, throw your hand up in the air. And let's just do business. That's it. Does it make sense? All right. One, two, three. Throw your hand up in the air if that's you. Yep. Anybody else? Anybody? Just throw it up in the air. Hands all over this place. And when I point at you, you can just put it down. Yep. 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 In the back, in the front there. Yep. Anybody else? Just throw it up in the air. Yep. Anybody else? Yep, yep. Back there, yep. Back there, back there. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Yep. Yep, over there. Anybody else? Yes. Yep. Okay, now. Yep. Okay. Here's what I want you to do is Listen, if you, if you did throw your hand in the air and you think, you know what, you're ready to take that next step, um, you can get baptized today, but no pressure. All I want you to do is, as you're watching people get baptized today, this is what I want you to realize. As people get baptized, some people get physically healed when they baptize, get baptized. When people get baptized, literally circumstances change. Why? Because angels are sent out on new assignments as a result of this. And if God does it for them, guess what? He can also do it for you. And all it takes isn't striving, it's surrender. And so what we're going to do is we're going to end today with an incredible party. And we're just going to have some fun with this. And so let's just quickly bow our heads, close our eyes, and pray over this. And then we're going to do the baptisms. And if you're here today, just this is how we're going to pray. Just a repeat after me prayer. Just, and I believe that God is going to show up. Just say this. Say, Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Renew me for your purposes. Starting today, I want to live for you 
wholly and completely, starting now, in Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that prayer, say amen. 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 With all that said, we're going to have our campus pastors come on up and tell us where we're going next. Love you guys.